Welcome to today's 3D print. Um, first little update, as you saw from my previous video, I'm doing a lot of cleaning up. I genuinely work six or seven days a week. I basically, if you include the YouTube channel, I hold three full-time jobs, and only one pays me. So, <laughs> well, technically the second one pays for this house so far, but I don't get no pay out of it. Um, but I've been working a lot of hours. I've been working Papa John's 9, 10 o'clock at night. You know, we've been busy, so I stay until we're not busy. Um, better I do there, the more valuable I am, the better hours I get. But anyway, um, now that I have this place cleaned up, almost finished, more content for prints will be coming. Basically, the printers have been largely unplugged for the last couple of weeks as I've been moving and cleaning and taking care of all the crap, the hoarder stuff in here. So now that I have the table set up and the rooms cleaned, the printers will get plugged back in and we will get some more delicious, yummy, goody prints coming. <laughs> so this week I have just a couple of prints, a couple of small ones and a couple of big ones to show you. First, this is cool. I, I One of the things I like doing is my little time, uh, not time lapse, my educational videos. As I figure stuff out and I want to try to explain it to people, a lot of times I will whiteboard stuff to make it easy to show you what's going on. And by the way, my brother was cleaning out the locker room in Hampton Mall and I got this amazing whiteboard for this. Oh yeah, nice aluminum frame, good quality whiteboard, not that cardboard stuff like the orange one I use where it holds on to the color. It's, ugh, this is a good whiteboard. Free. Yes, I love free. It's probably a $30 or $40 whiteboard in the store. And um, so I'll be able to, the idea is put a tripod on the table and have the camera, like, you know, the wide angle camera looking straight down. Well, here's the problem. I can't have the tripod in front of my face. The tripod has to be on the other side. So um, an example, if this is the whiteboard I'm drawing on and I'm sitting here in front of it, I need the camera here. But that means the camera's right here in my face as I'm trying to draw. So what I need to do is I need to put the camera over here. On, oh, on the opposite side. So I'd be sitting over here and the camera would be over here, but here's the problem. Now the image is upside down. So I need to somehow figure out how to turn the camera around. But now the tripod mount's on the wrong size, side. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to print a little open-ended square, like a, a calibration cube with the top and bottom missing. And then a hole in the side, of course, for the USB connection for power. And um, that will allow me to turn this around. But now I need a way of attaching that cube to both the camera and the tripod. So I want to see, could I, th I could buy those things. I have probably have things around here, but I got 3D printers. I want to use them. So I wondered, could I 3D print this stuff? And the answer is, holy crap, yes. This is amazing. This is a quarter 20 thumb screw I made. And it threads right in. That is absolutely amazing. Now, I mean, obviously it's plastic, so if I were to, it would just strip it or break it or kill it, but it's only got to hold the camera, so it doesn't need a whole lot of strength. And it works. And I said, okay, well now I need to attach this thing. That'll attach the cube to the camera, so that'll allow me to turn the camera around. There'd be a hole in the back of the cube, and this would go through the hole into the camera and hold the camera in place. Perfect, thumb screw, I can pop right off. But now I need a way to attach this new inverted cube to the tripod. So I need a quarter twenty nut. So I printed one. This is printed on the ender. That is a freaking quarter twenty nut with threads. And it works. I can actually thread this. I thread it onto the tripod and I can just spin it. Look at that. <laughs> The threads are so good and so clean that I can just spin it on. That's phenomenal. I, I, I guess I should have realized they can do it, but it just it never ceases to amaze me that these this little two hundred dollar printer has enough resolution to print a quarter twenty threaded wing nut that actually works. I can even apply a little bit of tension to it. I mean, I can't crank it, of course, but I can even I can tighten it, and it holds. That's that's amazing. I got these off thingy ears. Um, I'll try to find the links and post them, but um, that's just cool. Let me give you another shot of this. That's just amazing that you can do that. I love that. Uh, one more reason to love 3D printing. Well, as you know, we love the big knobs. 
I'll be making a set of these for the CR10 Mini this week. Um, but I'll see. I wanted the big knobs for the Tornado too. But the ones that were available either couldn't print right without support, didn't like it, and um, sloppy finish. Or um, they were just not pretty. They were just a biscuit, uh, a, a thick plate with a uh, wavy edge and holes. The ones for the CR10 are a lot cleaner. They just look cooler. They have a nice look to them. You know, there's actual dimension, shape, curves, fillets, um, stuff like that, um, bevels. So they look nice. They just have a nice look to them. So I took the center of the um, part for the TiVo Tornado and I merged it with the center of the CR10 nut. So this is the CR10 ultimate printing knob and I stuck the center of the TiVo Tornado knob into this one. So I cut out what was already there and I, oh, I made sure that the piece that I cut out of the TiVo one was a little bit bigger than this hole and stuck it in there and joined them together and then cleaned up the, the mesh edge there with a cut. So that now I have ultimate printing knobs for the TiVo Tornado that actually look nice. So I decided to stick with the apple green. I love this apple green color. It's just a very cool color. So those will go on my TiVo Tornado and I will post these as a remix to Thingiverse. Now comes the big bricks. Oh yeah. First, I thought I already did this. I guess I didn't. I feel so bad now. I think I did a partial video showing what I had done, and I never actually did the whole thing. Uh, this thing is cool. I just, it's been sitting here in the background. You've probably seen it a dozen times, and I just never realized I never made put it on video. But Miss Tube on YouTube, one of my viewers, sent me her damn troll, his damn troll, and here's the damn troll. <laughs> this thing is huge. How tall is this bugger? is 19 inches or 48 centimeters tall. This thing is wicked. Now, the trick with this is, is how do you print this? That's not going to print. That's going to take tremendous support to print that. Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, my passion is to uh, tear prints apart so I don't need support. <laughs> so, I printed him upside down and I started the print right there below his lip. It was a compromise between no support and not cutting the middle of his face. And so this part here, you can see the line right there. See the line? So that is one piece from here up to his feet. The only part I had problems with is it almost didn't close on the one finger, but it's fine, because remember that's going to be facing down now. And the, um, the area that his buttocks here almost didn't close. <laughs> That, that might be obscene. <laughs> I gotta find somebody to make me some clothes for him. You know, put a shirt on him at least. But um, and then I printed his head this way. This part is his head. The only support I needed, and I probably mm, now I wouldn't have been able to get away with it. I had just a tiny bit of support right between his lips there to support the upper lip. As you can see, that would have been a, a negative overhang. That, would, that probably would not have looked pretty. It would have printed, but there probably would have been a bunch of little extra plastic that had to cut off and his lips wouldn't look right. So just a tiny bit of support from this lip to this lip, and that was it. That was enough to make this whole thing print without support. And it is completely hollow. I, I think I have, yeah, I have um, infill here at this part, because this is such a flat surface. As you can see, it's very flat. So this would not have closed properly without some infill, but the infill stops right there and the rest is hollow. There's nothing in there. Infill would have fixed the finger, but then I would have had to have infill all throughout the legs here too. Um, one thing I wish Simplify 3D would do, if you guys are watching this, um, this is a print. So I have this, if, if you do a cross section slice right here, if you do a cross section slice right there, this is actually composed of three parts in cross section. It's all one part, but in cross section it's three parts. You have the fingers, you have the body, and then you have the other fingers. It would be nice if I can create a variable settings layer to say put infill from here to here, but only here, not here. Because this doesn't need any infill, but this could have used a little bit of infill. But I don't want to waste, you know, you know 100 grams of plastic and, and two hours of printing putting infill here when all I need is a tiny bit of infill right here in the tip of this finger. These fingers came out fine, no issues. Uh, that one could use it too. 
So a tiny bit of info right there, and a tiny bit of info right there would have made this perfect. All right, but the only way I could do that in Simplify 3D is to have info across the entire cross section. So it would be nice if the program would allow me to say, okay, this cross section here, don't put no infill, but just put it here and here. That would be a really nice addition to the program. Um, the feet came out nice, no problems. It stands up, sits on a table. So now, um, I believe this is a hat. So I wanna maybe try painting this a little bit. This is a sim this is big enough and simple enough that I could, my pathetic skills could probably get away with painting this. Now for the killer one. This is the cool one. Someone tried to print this and they were having problems. They were using the that 1099 Zyro Red Twinkling PLA. I love this stuff. Oh, this stuff is amazing. I'm so glad I bought five rolls of this. Because I'm going to do a lot of prints with that. If that stuff ever goes on sale again, I'm buying at least five rolls of each color goes on sale. So he was printing faceless. Now I had no problems printing with the plastic. As you can see here. This one and this one. I am working on taking over the world. As you can see, I have my armada. I have land. I have sea covered. And I have air and space covered. So you're all doomed. My little Marvin generals are going to take over the world. So I had no problems printing the Marvin in the red twinkling glitter. And I had no problem printing the Benchy in the red twinkling. So I was like, okay, maybe it's a height thing. Because he also had no problem printing a Benchy. Turns out it was just too low a temperature. I was able to print this at 200. He needed to print it at 220. That's another reason why special settings are required. You can't just trade settings. You can only trade basic profiles and then you have to tweak it. Because even two people using the same printer and the same filament might require different settings to get the same result. His kept on, um, you would see with the under extrusion in the layers, it destroyed the print. It was just the surface was horrible. And it was because the viscosity was too high. So it couldn't push the plastic. Now there's two reasons for that. He might have been running too cold. So even though he has it set for 220, 220 is where the thermistor registers. It might not be what the actual hot end is. So he might have a large deviation in temperature there. Or it could be that his extruder is slipping or his extruder stepper is dying or it doesn't have enough torque. And so the viscosity of this plastic at 200 was too high for it and it was losing steps or, um, or the temperature was lower than the thermostat was reporting and it would then be too high of viscosity and it would start losing steps because it can't push the plastic hard enough. Um, turning up the temperature reduces the viscosity takes care of the problem. So he turned his up to 220, he had no problem. But in the meantime, I said, wow, that's a cool model. I'm going to print a faceless. I'm not printing a small one. <laughs> oh no. The Ender is going to chew on one because I want to see the quality difference with the Ender. I'm going to actually do a 200mm um, a faceless. But, or I might not be able to do 200mm because the X and Y might go beyond 150. So whatever the largest faceless I can do on the Ender, I'm going to do one on the Ender one on the Tornado, one on the CR-10, and one on the Mini. So I can have four identical ones with the same profile. Um, when I say profile, each profile will be tuned for each printer, but you know, same infill where it's needed, etc. Same number of perimeters, same filament, etc. Um, for all four of those printers, and then compare them side by side and see what the differences are. So I printed a 395 millimeter tall faceless in the Twinkling Red. And it came out <laughs> amazing. I mean, this thing is really cool. Are you ready for this? Look at that. Actually, that would be a good thumbnail right there. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to have to save that as a thumbnail. But uh, this is cool. I, I, I was really worried about these swords, but they're absolutely straight. Look how smooth those sword blades are. Those lines you're seeing, those are the shadows inside the print of the infill. You do not feel them on the outside. It is smooth. That's the infill. So that's the infill lines. I have, um, I think, 5% or 10% infill in here. Down here I have like 30% because I knew this base would be a problem. You can see all the infill there. There it goes. This top layer is butter smooth. The only thing I feel at all is the traces when the um, 
print head move across the layer to print the different pieces. So it, it touches slightly because the plastic hasn't shrunken down out of the way. So you have that little scrape mark. But beyond that, it is, look at, look at the picture, you can see it in the light. Look how smooth that is. Huh. Incredible. I was really worried about that base, you know, pillowing and stuff. Absolutely beautiful. I did the hex infill because it looks pretty at this scale. Because you can see through it. You can see right through the print. I don't know if you can see that from your end. I could probably enhance that a little bit. By backlighting it for you. Oh, yeah. What the? Oh. Whoa, look at that. I don't know if you can see that. But there's a um, a refresh rate for this LED. It must be flickering, and the camera is seeing that refresh rate. Oh, that's crazy. Huh. There's an interaction between the camera and the LED's refresh rate. But you can see all the filament there. I'm going to have to experiment with that. That's kind of cool. I wonder if that picked up in the recording, or if that's just what I saw. But um, you can see the, the infill lines up through his entire body. I do still have a little bit of noise. You can see it on the back here. Okay. It appears to be a Y motion noise because the noise doesn't exist on the sides here where the Y bed's moving back and forth where the X would generate noise. It appears on the front and back of the print, meaning the X is moving back and forth and noise would be generated by the Y not moving correctly. So I may try a second TL smoother. But this noise is definitely what I would classify as noise. It's nothing. It's below the radar. Only, only someone like me who is particularly OCD picky about the quality of my prints would even notice it. Anybody else? They would say this thing is flawless. Okay, so when I say that it has that noise, that is strictly my perfectionist, you know, because I have all these printers and I make these prints and I, I see it. Average Joe would never see this but you can see it all over the back of his head there. But this is amazing. This plastic is so cool. This is um, three perimeters. I didn't want to make it too thick because um, I wanted to be able to see through it. I wanted to have that translucent effect. So it's 1.2 millimeters thick, but that is so cool. You also don't want it too transparent. because too transparent and you'll have difficulty seeing the surface meaning you will lose details because you'll be seeing through it instead of at it. So you've got to find that balance between translucence and opaqueness. This thing is so neat. This is one of my favorite prints now. This, this, whoever modeled this, I'm going to post a link to Thingiverse, of course, although I don't think it's on Thingiverse. I think I got this from my manufacturing. But um, this model is amazing. They did a fantastic job. It prints without support. I believe it might have been able to print without infill at all. Um, on a smaller scale, absolutely. You could probably get away with printing this with zero infill. I didn't want to take a chance of a... Uh, actually, it ended up taking 36 hours. I thought it was going to take 40 or 50, but it, it actually stayed closer to the predicted time. Um, so it took 36 hours to print this on the Tornado. Very, very impressive. Very cool. Oh, that is neat. That is very, very neat. That's it for today. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Today's mega print episode is over. Enjoy.